welcome. We're so glad to have you worshiping with us. You know, as believers in Jesus, we all have a story. We have a testimony. And uh, I hope you'll enter in and sing this with us as we lift high the name of Jesus. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection Echoing his eminence 
that you would consume us, have your way in us.
In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes to the church there about communion. This is what he says in verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we gather to take communion together, we are proclaiming that we belong to God and that we trust in him. Not only that, but we take communion together and we remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross and we look forward to the glorious day of his return and what an amazing experience that will be. Whenever we do this each week together with the right attitude, it gives us the chance for spiritual growth because we come to God and acknowledge our sins, our imperfections, and then we pause and remember the one who is perfect, and we celebrate in that. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you for this chance to partake communion, to remember the sacrifice you made on the cross for our sins, how you would not be stopped by our failings, but that you did everything that it took to bring us into a relationship with you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. As we get ready to celebrate the chance to give here at Mount Pleasant, we always want to say thank you so much for your continued support for all of our ministries here and all that that allows us to do. You can see on the screen the different ways you can participate in giving, and we always want to encourage you to do that. We're so thankful. Now, we also highlight, uh, celebrate, talk about our Change for Dollar ministry at this point in our service. Our challenge for you to give $1 extra for every member of your family. We take that money and immediately give it away as a gift to someone in need. I'm going to read this week's Change for Dollar story for you, and then I will pray. On May 23rd, 19-year-old Christopher was in a serious car accident. 
He suffered a traumatic brain injury, and after many weeks of tests and treatments, doctors told his mom and dad that there was nothing more that they could do for him in the hospital. So they took him home. He is cared for 24 hours a day, currently by his mom, Mary. There are many needs that the family has in order to take care of him properly. They feel overwhelmed, but they trust in God for this provision. Their prayer is for healing for Christopher, and they've already seen some progress in ways that the doctors did not even expect. Change for dollar funds will be used to offset the cost of equipment needed for Christopher's ongoing care. Would you pray with me? Well, God, Father God, we thank you so much for the way that you provide for us. For all that you've given us, help us to be good stewards of that, to be joyful, generous, and thankful in all that we have. We pray, Lord, just like his mom and dad, for Christopher's healing. We know that all things are in your hands and in your control. We pray that you would give this family strength and encouragement as they continue on in this difficult journey. We love you, Lord. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today through our online campus. So uh, good to uh, worship with you today. And I'm so uh, thankful to be back in the pulpit, uh, back with you after being gone for the last three weeks. Every July, uh, Sandy and I uh, take some time away. We spend a week of vacation with our entire family, and then she and I spend a week together on our own. I'm very grateful for the leaders of our church and their generosity in allowing us to do this every year, and I'm very grateful for the guys who filled in for me while I was gone. I listened to their messages and thought each of them did a, a great job, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to be back with you today. If you got a Bible, I want you to grab it and go ahead and open it to the Gospel of Mark in the sixth chapter and just to hold that ready for a few minutes. Uh, several years ago, when I first came to Mount Pleasant, all the way back in 2001, I hadn't been here very long when I preached a sermon series, a brief sermon series, from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. That's where we read about the Great Commission. And at the beginning of each message in that sermon series, I ask the same question. The question was, can a single church in central Indiana change the world? Now, I didn't ask that question because I thought that God had somehow placed some special anointing or special blessing or special calling on our church. I didn't ask that question out of some kind of personal ambition. I didn't ask that question because I'm a particularly visionary leader or anything like that. I asked that question because of a belief and conviction that I have that God wants and expects us to use our lives for something greater than ourselves. I really believe that's a fundamental part of Jesus is calling. We've got our Bibles open in Mark chapter 6. If you go just a couple of chapters over to Mark chapter 8, you read these words from Jesus in verses 34 and 35. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Now friends, there's an obvious meaning in those words connected to salvation and faith, but there's also, at least in my, in my mind rather, an additional meaning connected to purpose. Jesus wants us to live our lives with purpose. In his book, Rich, Free, and Miserable, John Bruggeman, who is a sociologist, shares this following story. He talks about climbing Mount Everest being one of the challenges that inspire a lot of people to try to do something bigger with their lives. He says lots of people try, even though 10% of the people who do die in the process. It's a dangerous undertaking. He even writes that many of the corpse, corpses of those who have died line the paths, continue to line the path up the mountain, yet people still want to climb the mountain, even though it has no real redeeming social value. And then he writes that a few years ago, one climber, David Sharp, was clearly in trouble on the mountain, and there were 40 climbers who noticed his obvious need but passed him by that day. He ended up dying on Mount Everest because none of the other climbers, the 40 who passed him, were willing to put their personal goals on hold long enough to help him. That's not the kind of life that Jesus calls us to. He calls us to live a life of service. That's the life he modeled. That's the life he calls us to. And friends, that's the kind of life that has the power to change the world. Now, 
as a church, and I and listen, it's it's not lost on me that this idea of changing the world is a huge thing. But as a church, as a body of believers, as a spiritual community, we've really been able to live out that calling to change the world, at least change different corners of the world in a variety of different ways over the years. Uh, through our Change the World Weeks, we've packed well over one million meals that have been shipped to people in need overseas. The last couple of times we did that, we shipped those meals to a ministry partner in Cuba, and they came at a critical time for people in Cuba. I hope that you're praying for the people in Cuba right now. We have a ministry partner there with a lot of need and a lot of uh, problems, a lot of division, a lot of strife going on in Cuba right now. As a church, we've been able to give well away well over $1 million just through the Change for a Dollar initiative. In one of our last weekend services before the COVID shutdown, we celebrated passing that milestone, passing the milestone of giving away over a million dollars through Change for a Dollar. And because we had a little bit of money from Change for a Dollar that hadn't been spent, we began the Change for a Dollar initiative on the first weekend of July in 2015, and we were having this celebration in March of 2020, because we had a little bit of money left over, we were, to, we were able to take that money, and through a partnership with an organization called RIP Medical Debt, which is a 501c3, we were able to eliminate a little over $7 million of unpaid medical debt for people right here in central Indiana. We focused first on the community of Greenwood, and then we focused on all the different neighborhoods where our impact campuses are located. Change for a dollar monies have changed the world, literally changed the world for a number of people in tangible ways over the past five years. Because of the collective generosity of this church, we've been able to fully fund the translation of the scriptures into the language of the single largest unreached people group in the world. This is a group of people that live in a remote part of Asia. Because of the collective generosity of our church, we recently gave over $700,000 to the building of a new mission hospital in central India through Central India Christian Mission. This is the only hospital, I've told you this before, it's amazing, this is the only hospital in a region in central India that serves over 10 million people. I love this kind of thing. I love that we as a church, as a family, as a spiritual community are able in tangible ways to live out the challenge of trying to change the world. But I also want us to understand that changing the world is not just something we can do together as a spiritual community. It's also something that we can do as we live out our individual lives of faith. And that brings us to Mark chapter 6. And so if you've got your Bibles open there, I want you to follow along as I read what I know is going to be a familiar passage to most of you today. And that's Mark chapter 6, verse 30, down through verse 44. This is Mark's account of the feeding of the 5,000. You listen as I read. The apostles, gathered, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving <clears throat> recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. 
And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Let's stop right there. Let me give you a little bit of context for this passage of Scripture. Earlier in the Gospel of Mark, and as you've got your Bible open there, if you look back toward the beginning of the chapter, you can see this for yourself. Earlier in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus had sent the disciples out, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles in groups of two, and he sent them out to do ministry. Now, there's a lot more detail about what they did uh, and this whole endeavor in Matthew's gospel than there is in Mark's. But basically, they went out preaching and teaching and performing supernatural miracles like casting out demons and healing uh, people who were sick. It was a really big deal. It was an incredible experience. And when our passage begins, it begins with the disciples having returned and reporting back to Jesus all the things that they had done. But because this was a time in Jesus' ministry when he was incredibly popular. As we read in the text, there were so many people coming and going trying to see Jesus that he decided that he needed to get his disciples away to a solitary place so that they could rest, so they could rest and be refreshed. And so he gets in a boat and he tries to do that. But as we read in the text, uh, no matter how far he went, he couldn't escape the crowd. And even though he was tired, and the disciples were tired, and there was a need for rest. Mark chapter 6 and verse 34 says, When Jesus landed, this is after he had left, got in a boat with his disciples, and gone to another place that's described as a solitary place. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd because he couldn't escape the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were, sheep, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And as a result, Jesus began to teach them many things. That's what Mark says. You know, I've been a Christian for over 50 years and a pastor for over 40, but I don't think I've ever really given much thought to the phrase sheep without a shepherd before this past week as I was studying this particular passage. Now, it's something that I've heard and something that I've read literally dozens of times in my life as a Christian, but I don't think I ever really gave much thought to what that really means or what that really represents, the image that's being portrayed. But don't you think, as we think about it in the context of ancient days, don't you think sheep without a shepherd would have been a pretty pitiful sight because of how helpless and vulnerable a flock of sheep would be without a shepherd? They wouldn't know where to find uh, green pasture or water. They wouldn't know when they should move and when they should stay put. They would be vulnerable to a variety of different predators and you could go on and on and on. Clearly the Holy Spirit, as he was inspiring the writing of this gospel, was trying to communicate something really specific with these words, with this description of the people being like sheep without a shepherd. In ancient days, a flock of sheep without a shepherd would have been a really unusual thing. Well, fast forward to today, and my question would be, what kind of phrase would we use to communicate the same level of helplessness and futility? I mean, we could say the people were like a bus full of people without a driver. Nah, that doesn't come even close. A classroom of students without a teacher, maybe a little closer, but that falls pretty far short. A village of people without clean water? Closer. Children without parents? Closer. Hospitals without doctors? Nursing homes without visitors? I think all those things get a little bit closer. But none of them really capture the same meaning. Because what Jesus was talking about were lost and lonely people with absolutely no idea of just how much they are loved and valued by God. And Mark says that the sight of these people, even given the context of Jesus trying to get his disciples away for a time of rest and refreshment, the sight of these people who were like sheep without a shepherd moved him with compassion to the point where he forgot about his own needs, and he forgot about the needs of the disciples, and he began to focus his time and attention on those people.
Well, the story goes on to tell us that after a while, the disciples came to Jesus, and this is what they said to him. This is Mark 6, verses 35 and 36. This is a remote place, and it's already very late. Send these people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And so, while Jesus looked at the crowd and saw sheep without a shepherd, the disciples looked at the crowd and saw people who, at least from their perspective, were a nuisance. They didn't look at them with compassion like Jesus did. They looked at them with annoyance. Now, as quickly as I say that, I want to push the pause button and I want to cut the disciples a little bit of slack. I mean, remember where they have been. They've been on the road pouring their lives out in ministry to other people, people just like the ones that were there that day. They've been doing nothing but meeting the needs of people for the past several days, the past week, the past couple of weeks, however long it was. We don't really know how long it was. You ever heard, have you ever heard of something called compassion fatigue? That's a real thing. Compassion fatigue happens when you experience emotional and sometimes even physical exhaustion as the result of showing compassion for other people, for caring for other people. And it's so great that all of a sudden, because you're emotionally drained, you begin to be unable to feel compassion for anyone, regardless of their need. I've experienced that in my life as a pastor on several different occasions. I think most pastors have. So I don't want to come down too hard on the disciples. The truth is life is hard and sometimes it takes all we have just to get through the day to meet our own needs and the needs of the people that we're responsible for. But the bottom line is when the disciples looked at the crowd gathered together that day in that remote place late in the day, they didn't see a problem that had anything to do with them. Did someone need to do something about the crowd? Yes. Was that someone them? No. And so, because Jesus didn't feel that way, he saw this as a teachable moment. Even more than that, I think he saw it as a life-changing moment. And so in Mark chapter 6 and verse 37, Jesus looked at them and said what they didn't expect for him to say. He said, you give them something to eat. They said, it's late, send the crowd away so they can go to the countryside and the villages and the places around to buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus countered by saying, you give them something to eat. Now, that wasn't just unexpected by the disciples. I think that was something the disciples viewed as impossible. And here's why I say that. We've already seen in the text, it was late in the day. They were in a remote place. There wasn't a lot of time to go and search for food. Not only that, the disciples already said it would take eight months of a man's wages to feed this kind of crowd. They didn't have that kind of money. In fact, friends, the disciples, they didn't have any money. And Jesus would have known that. And the reason why I say that is, remember, they had just returned from going out two by two to do ministry. And before they left, this is part of the instruction Jesus gave to them. You can see this if you back up to Mark chapter six and verse eight. As they were preparing to go out, Jesus said to them, take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Jesus knew they didn't have anything. But Jesus also knew that if they looked, if they made an effort they would find something. And whatever they found would be more than enough. And that's what happened. Mark chapter 6 and verse 38, Jesus doubles down and he looks at them and he says, how many loaves do you have? How many loaves do you have? Go and see. We know from other gospel accounts of the same story. And by the way, this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle Jesus performed that's found in all four gospels. We know from other gospel accounts of this same story that they went out and they found a boy who brought a lunch with him and his lunch consisted of five loaves of bread and two fish. And so they presented the five loaves and the two fish to Jesus who, as we read earlier, took them and performed a supernatural miracle, a supernatural miracle of multiplication that not only fed all of the people who were there until they were satisfied, but also resulted in 12 basketfuls of leftovers. And what makes that even more amazing 
is that Mark chapter 6 and verse 44 tells us that the number of men who ate that day was 5,000. That's just the number of men that were there. He fed multiple thousands of people with what they had, five loaves and two fish. Now, there are so many things we could talk about from this story, important things. We could talk, for example, about the compassion of Christ. That's where all this began, the compassion of Jesus, which is really a, mar- a remarkable thing. Remember, the disciples had returned from a time of personal ministry. They were, they were worn out, and uh, Jesus was concerned about them because there were so many people coming and going that they, the disciples didn't even have time to eat. They had no time to rest, no time for refreshment. And so he tries to put them in a boat and escape the crowd, but... That doesn't work in the end because the crowd just continues to find Jesus. And that's when we read in Mark's account that Jesus had compassion on them. But it wasn't just the fact that Jesus was concerned about his disciples and their need for separation and their need for rest. There's there's another thing going on here that we haven't even talked about. And that's the fact that Jesus, in the midst of all of this, was also grappling with his own personal grief as the result of the execution of John the Baptist. Again, if you look back in Mark chapter six, where we've got our Bibles open, you'll see that the story of the execution of John the Baptist is recorded there in Mark chapter six, verses 14 through 29. When you look at Matthew's account of John the Baptist's death, uh, it's in Matthew chapter 14, verses one through 12. This is how it ends. This is Matthew 14 and verse 12. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it Now note this, then they went and told Jesus. Jesus knew what had just happened. He knew about John's death. So there was a lot going on in this moment. There was Jesus' concern for his disciples, and there was also private grief and the private pain he was experiencing in his own life at the death of John the Baptist. And yet, when he saw the crowd that he couldn't escape, he had compassion on them. I think that's an incredibly remarkable thing. It tells us a lot about our Savior, the compassionate heart of our Savior. We could talk about the provision of Jesus. I mean, this is an extraordinary miracle. I, I, I think we can all agree on the fact that what Jesus did with five loaves and two fish was just beyond amazing. We could talk about the abundance of Jesus. Not only was there enough food from that five loaves and two fish to feed the multiple thousands of people who were there that day, there were leftovers, 12 basketfuls of leftovers. And that just, again, it teaches us some great truth about Jesus. He's, he's, not, just a, he's not a just enough Savior. He's a more than enough Savior. Uh, that the whole story makes me think of the words of John chapter 10 and verse 10 where Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I know that's an older translation that comes from the New American Standard Bible, but that's the translation that I learned when I was young and that's the translation that I like the best. Jesus gives us abundance, not just enough. He gives us abundance. And we could talk about so many different things, but I want to just focus on one thing as we begin to bring this to a close. In Mark's gospel, when Jesus tells the disciples that they need to feed the crowd, they respond by saying, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? And Jesus responds by asking, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. In other words, if we were to shorten that, paraphrase it a little bit, when, when they basically said, how in the world are we going to do this? When Jesus said, you feed them, Jesus looked back at them and basically said, well, what do you have? What do you have? In light of this large crowd and this overwhelming need, what do you have? You see, when it came to feeding the crowd, the disciples were focused on what they didn't have. We don't have time, it's late in the day. We don't have money, it would take eight months wages to feed a crowd like this. We don't have organizational skills. We don't have the gift of mercy. You can go on and on and on. But Jesus wasn't interested in what they didn't have. He was interested in 
helping them identify what they did have. And friends, that's all he wanted from them and that's all he wants from any of us because at least in my experience as a pastor, when Jesus asks us to serve him, he asks us for what we have. And the truth is, even though we might have very little, with Jesus, it will always be enough. You know, if Jesus asks you to serve people uh, and then says, what do you have to do that? Um, we might just have a limited amount of time. It might just be enough time to serve as a volunteer in a ministry at church once a week or maybe even once a month. We might just have uh, a limited amount of time that would only enable us to visit or care for somebody in need, or for somebody who was lonely, or something like that. Just one person a month, or a week. When Jesus asks us to be generous, he, he just says, what do you have? And the truth is, we all have different amounts. But the beauty of generosity, especially the kind of generosity that it takes to support a ministry like Mount Pleasant Christian Church, is that it's not characterized by equal gifts, it's characterized by equal sacrifice. In other words, what I have to give and what you have to give may be very different, but both are equally important. And so when he asks us to be generous, he says, what do you have? And it, and it may not even be just about what do you have right now, maybe it's what could you have? I mean, let me, let me frame the question like this. What would you have to sacrifice in your life each month to be able to support an, in, an orphan in India each month? When Jesus asks us to make disciples by being willing to share our faith with others, <clears throat> he does it by saying, what do you have? He's not asking, did you go to Bible college and seminary where you learned how to particular, uh, to uh, perfectly articulate the gospel or perfectly defend the gospel. He's not asking, are you outgoing? Are you bold? Are you relentless? Are you a quick thinker? Are you clever? He's not asking, are you a master of debate? Of debate? <clears throat> He's asking, can you develop a friendship with someone who's not a Christian? And with a sincere heart, can you invest in that friendship to the point of discovering that person's personal story and then can you prayerfully ask God to help you discern what your next step might be in pointing that person to Jesus? See, the bottom line is this. Jesus doesn't ask us to give him what we don't have. But he does ask us to look at our lives, see what we do have, and then put that to use for his purpose. And just like in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, if you're willing to do that, even if you have very little, if you're willing to take it and put it to use for Jesus, then he will take it from there. He took those five loaves and those two fish and he multiplied them to feed multiple thousands of people with food left over. If he can do that with one boy's lunch, because that's what he had, he can do something similar with whatever you have, regardless of how small it may seem to you. You know, Jesus accomplished two things that day with the feeding of the 5,000. First and most obvious, he blessed the crowd. He blessed the crowd in that moment. But second, he provided his disciples with a tremendous, unforgettable opportunity to experience growth. The Bible makes it clear that God expects us to be growing in our faith and as committed as I am to that growth happening through worship experiences like this where we open up our Bibles and we read and we study and we try to apply the things that we read and study to our lives, as much as I am excited about, those, about opportunities for growth happening through small group experiences and specific Bible studies and on and on and on, I also know that there's an element of growth that will only happen when people like you and me are willing to step out of our comfort zone and answer the question from Jesus, what do you have? What do you have to offer? And we offer it up in a way that he can use to make an impact. An impact that might even change the world, at least for someone somewhere. An impact that might change the world, one life, one family, one opportunity at a time. 
If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to answer the question that Jesus asked the disciples with regard to your personal life, what do you have? And you offer it up to Jesus, then you're going to experience more growth in your spiritual life than you've ever experienced before. And you're going to be able to make a greater spiritual impact on some part of the world, no matter how small it might be, than you could have ever imagined. And so I'll close with Jesus' question when it comes to your life and following Jesus, your life and serving Jesus, your life and changing the world in the name of Jesus. What do you have? I want you to pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for a brief time together in your word. I know it sounds crazy, even ridiculous maybe to some, that any one person's life could be used to change the world, that any one church, any single church could be used to change the world. But until we as believers around the world embrace that truth, until churches around the world embrace that truth, our world is going to continue to be lost and broken and filled with people, to use the language of the story, who are as helpless and hopeless as sheep without a shepherd. And so we pray that you would use our church collectively together and each one of us individually as a part of the church to be willing to answer the question of Jesus, what do you have? and offer it to him in a world-changing way. Help us to know that this is something we can do with Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. Death could